I'd like uh, to welcome you all to uh, the driver workshop uh, net dev session. Today we have uh, lined up a couple of talks uh, mainly related to uh, latest driver updates from uh, different vendors. I'll start from uh, some performance update or uh, performance related topics um, and then gradually move on to uh, more scalability and uh, unique customizability sort of things. And we'll make a nice segue then to the OCP efforts um, to define a standard NIC. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, uh, my colleagues here, Ashita, Sridhar, Simon, myself, and William who will be doing the talks. And uh, just a small update, Sridhar, you're gonna start first. Uh, is that okay? I'm gonna stop my yeah. share and uh, you can take over. Okay, let me share. You see my okay. uh, it's loading. Yeah, we can. Okay. Okay. So today uh, I'm going to st uh, give a start with a brief recap of uh, uh, what ADQ is and the features that enable uh, acceleration of applications, uh, and then start uh, talk and talk about a few enhancements that we are currently working on that will broaden the scope of adq and uh, to enable applications without any changes and also uh, accelerate applications that are running in containers and vms okay. so going to the next slide yeah, so what is ADQ? So ADQ is basically a technology uh, that uses a combination of uh, hardware capabilities and uh, Linux networking software features to accelerate applications. And th this is to enable uh, delivering predictability and, and so that predictability by reducing the jitter and uh, improving the tail latencies. So those are the main uh, main goals for ADQ, okay? And how is this accomplished? This is accomplished using a set of features. So uh, I've listed the features that are already upstream, okay? So the, the core feature is to split the device queues into multiple dedicated and isolated queue groups that can be assigned to an application. And how is this done? This is done via filters. In the case of receive, it is done via hardware receive filters that are offloaded to hardware and they will they can direct uh, application traffic to a specific queue group or a traffic class okay. and uh, similarly in the transmit side it is uh, either we use the xps the transmit packet steering that is supported in the uh, networking stack or we can use the tx filters to direct to a queue group or a queue in the transmit side. And the other feature in the transmit side is also the rate uh, rate limiting. So that can be configured per queue group and then offloaded to hardware. Okay. Once we do all this alignment of the threads to the application, uh, to the queues, uh, it also allows to enable the more optimal way of uh, up, uh, DC polling that is triggered from the applications. So basically, because a thread is now align, assigned to a queue, so it we can uh, the thread can op, do a uh, op, very optimized busy polling via this busy poll uh, and the NAPI deferred R, R IRQ, deferred IRQ and the GRO flush timeout configurations that are supported in the kernel. Okay. Going to the next slide. Yeah, so this slide actually shows a pictorial view of how this is all 
done. So here in this example, as you can see, that the device has three Q groups configured. So the default uh, TC or the default Q group has two Qs, and the first application gets the next second, the next two Qs, and the third one, the application two, has the four Qs. And we configure filters to direct traffic to these Q groups based on the application. And then the polling is uh, the there are actually currently we only support the application dependent polling where the polling is triggered from the application when it makes the system calls. So, and so this requires some minor changes to the applications. So, so one concern that was raised was this, this can, because of this requirement, we cannot enable uh, all the applications or some applications, it may not be easy to change. So to address that, uh, requirement actually we are introducing this application independent polling so that i will be talking later so in the yeah in the next few slides i will just talk about uh, how to configure adq quickly we'll go over this so the first step is to uh, uh, create the queue groups this is done via this uh, mq prior queuing discipline where you can create traffic classes, you can specify a uh, number of traffic classes and the priority to the TC mapping for the transmit sites via this map and then the queue groups configuration. The number of queues in each queue group can be specified via this queues uh, parameter. Okay, And when this is off, when this is done, right, basically each queue group gets its own RSS context and uh, to be in order to uh, for the application threads to be associated with a single queue uh, we can use the this so incoming nap eid socket option uh, for applications that use load balancing of incoming connections within the app they can use this socket option or if they are using the kernel load balancing they can use the so reuse port uh, bpf program to assign a, align a thread to a queue. Okay. So the, once the queue groups are configured, the next step is to configure the filters. The filter configuration is done via the TC flower uh, mechanism, where you can add a filter to match on the application identifier, like the destination IP and the destination port, and directing to a specific queue group. So the queue group specified via this hardware TC uh, command okay. and within a queue group uh, based, by default the RSS can be used so because each queue group get, gets its own RSS context so RSS will select a queue within a queue group by default or if you want a specific queue it can be done via this entiple filters or ERFS okay quickly going to the TX uh, the similarly on the TX side, actually there are multiple ways of uh, selecting the Q group. So it can be done by uh, either the C groups mechanism or the SO priority socket option if the application can be modified or even we can use the TC SKB edit rule to set the priority of the SKB in the transmit path. And and the queue selection within a queue group is done via the XPS, or it can, can I even use the SKB edit that can be used to even set the queue in the TX path. Okay. Okay, so this is all supported today in the upstream kernel. Now I'm going to introduce a few new enhancements that we're currently uh, working on and in the plan of upstreaming. So there are three new features. The first one is the application independent busy polling, and we are calling them as independent pollers. And the second one is the hardware offloaded receive filters using the TC SKB edit action. So in the transmit side, we already support this using TC SKB edit queue mapping. We can select the TX queue. The same thing we are planning to do it in the receive side. And this actually the patches for this is are already submitted upstream and 
uh, it went through a couple of reviews and hopefully uh, they should get accepted soon the third one is the inline flow steering so this is to spread the receive flows evenly among the queues in a queue group so today if you are using rss and if the number of flows are uh, not that many so the, they may not be evenly spread among the queues so this mechanism will allow the round robin scheduling of uh, selecting of the queues based on the new connections okay. yeah so let us go into some uh, deeper into the independent callers. So, so here are some of the use cases that uh, this feature is going to enable. So the first main uh, uh, application is the basically to, uh, it will allow any application without any changes. So we, because the polling is not triggered from the application, so we don't need the app thread to alignment to a device queue. So, but, and the, busy polling is actually triggered via the interrupts and uh, it is independent from the application that is one use case and also it allows any application running in the uh, within a container for example in a kubernetes deployments uh, uh, application running in, in a pod that is using ve as an interface can also be accelerated with using this mechanism and similarly even uh, VM uh, applications running in the VMs that are using the whatever net interface also can be accelerated. Okay, and let me show how this works. So, yeah, today basically the independent polling mechanism is built on the standard NAPI polling mechanism that is Sorry. done to. Can you? Uh... Maximize your screen. The slideshow. Yeah. Oh, okay. So just the text is uh, unreadable. Is it better? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. If you can improve the text size. Uh, this is the maximum. So is it only for this slide or are you seeing having the issue? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's fine. It should be fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you can uh, just increase the size of the font from the PowerPoint. Yeah, this became too big, I guess. Uh, this should do it. Okay. Uh, let me start the slideshow again. Okay. So here in this example, again, we, this is the same, same example that I showed earlier. So we have the, uh, we're focusing on the, the blue Q group. So it has four, uh, four queues and assigned to an application that is using four threads. In the normal case, each thread will be assigned to a specific queue, aligned to a queue and the thread will initiate the busy polling. But with independent polar mechanism, you can configure polar threads that are independent and uh, the number of polars per queue group also uh, is a configurable parameter. So you can have a polar polling on uh, more than one device queue so that we can reduce the number of polars. So, and a polar timeout also can be configured per polar, uh, per queue group. So here in this example, we have two polars for these four queues and there are two polar threads, only two queues each. So how is this done? This is basically done by the, the nappy polling today, what happens is when you, the nappy polling is triggered by the interrupt and we stay in the nappy polling until there is work to be done. We keep uh, scheduling the nappy. So one small change that we are doing is, so 
don't come out of the polling uh, even if there is no work done for a configurable polar timeout so that we can, will keep staying in the polling and these pollers will pu pull the packets from the dev device queues and push them to the application socket queues and this basically removing the need for the application to uh, do the polling so because the polar threads are push pushing the packets to the socket queues whenever the application thread wants to uh, tries to do a read it should most of the time it should find the packets already in the socket queues so that's how it is helping the uh, latencies and the jitter okay and this mechanism basically uh, enables more environments and use cases without any application changes okay yeah and how is this configured so we are actually this is not yet submitted upstream but we are proposing eth tool as the mechanism to configure the polars and the polar timeout via the eth tool context parameters so today it is only supports uh, uh, configuring the rss indirection table and hash key and such such parameters the plan is to extend it to support these two new parameters so yeah the by default the case of tire queue threads act as the independent polars but in the linux kernel 5.13 and newer there is a way to use kernel threads as these polars and i think this is a better way to enable independent polars because we have more control of pinning these polar threads so that the for a best case scenario basically we should isolate the polar threads to be running on cores that are independent from the applications okay yeah so now actually i will talk about a specific use case where this can be used uh, so here we are showing a kubernetes deployment that is using a vith data path so with pods running on the two servers so in this example actually we we are showing that the device queues are split into uh, 16 queue groups the tc0 is the default and tc1 and tc2 are used by these two pods so they they, they are using multiple queues per uh, per pod in this scenario and the pod m to n they are sharing a single tc so single queue group is shared by uh, these pods because one queue is more than sufficient for these four pods okay and this type of configuration is possible with the adq and i will show you how the filters can be configured for this uh, type of configuration uh, Sridhar, you got five minutes, and I know okay. you have uh, two other points you want to discuss, so maybe just quickly yeah, go yeah. through them and uh, leave okay. some room for questions. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so this is the showing the queue group configuration in this example. So we, we can split the uh, device queues into uh, 16 queue groups, and uh, each queue, depending on the requirement, you can configure the number of queues in each so, queue group. So the first uh, 14 are using multiple queues, and the, uh, the last one is uh, a single large queue group with large number of queues. And uh, this queue group can be shared across multiple pods. OK, I think the filters, again, so in the ingress side, you can use the uh, PC flower filter to direct to a queue group and then use this uh, new actually this is another feature that I talked about where we want to do the flow steering in a raw uh, in a basically to evenly spread the incoming flows we are introducing this uh, new context parameter called inline flow steering so to direct to evenly spread the flows among the queues, queues in a queue group and the egress side actually we can use the skb edit to 
to either select the Q or the Q group. For the exclusive TCs, basically a TC where a single pod is using one Q group, uh, we can use only the priority. For in case of uh, a, using a single Q, we can use priority and Q mapping. Okay, and this is the last slide on how to configure the polars. I already mentioned that this is going to be done via the new context parameters called num polars and the polar timeout. Okay, I think that comes to the end of my slides. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. So I have one question. Uh, what triggers the polars and when do they stop? Oh, the interrupts. And so they the interrupt keep pulling until timeout? Until the polar timeout. Don't we already have oh. such a feature? Uh, Nappy pulling, it's already there, I believe. Uh... Uh, but there is no, it is a, we want to do it, control it per Q group and okay. also Polar timeout can be configured per Q group. What we have right now, right now we have logic that says, okay, you've been pulling for two seconds. Stop. You have to stop because we have to let the uh, R RCU come in the free memory. And no, search. what I have when you report Nappy busy, it will keep pulling even like for a couple of whatever milliseconds. For the sake of yeah. Yeah. So right now, what we have, with, right now, what we have with current Nappy. Is it has to stop at, like I think after two seconds because otherwise if we left it running forever we basically stomp on RCU and we don't give it a chance to yeah. free memory. Yeah. Um, what what he, I think he's describing is we don't have work just keep pulling for at least one second after the interrupts fired. So yeah. So the difference that we don't have work because before the condition was we have work yeah. keep going right. But it will keep going even if you don't have work. Yeah. With with what he's describing here, yeah, it keeps going just for. You know, regardless of if there's work or not, it just keeps pulling. Okay. So basically, it's going to be burning one CPU at least, or however many he has for his pulling threads, just waiting for work to come in. Okay. So an idle system ends up being that much more expensive as a result. What happens if uh, application migrates? Just keep pulling for no reason. I mean, oh yeah, the socket is still the same. Yeah, I think the socket stays yeah. the same. It'll become an mm -hmm. IPI. Yeah, it'll become an IPI, copying between CPUs. So oh, yeah. Okay. So for the Kubernetes case, why not use subfunctions and give it a device? Oh yeah. So th that is, if it is possible to you, the subfunction that requires is passing the subfunction netdev to the pod, right? So today most of the deployments use VEAT as the pod interface. So yeah, that that is a different way, another way of uh, accelerating right, the Kubernetes. In. I know it takes time to put in the sub-function code to get yeah. container systems to start using it, but that seems mm -hmm. a better long-term solution. And that's actually kind of what they're using but in the back end anyway. You mentioned DSI, and that's a sub-function. Right. Yeah, and the sub functions actually require the infrastructure to be offloaded to the IPU. Those type there, I think it would help. Where if the if the so data path, the routing and the tunneling, if it has to be done in software, then uh, that may not be feasible. Yeah, I mean, uh, should there, we are going to support both, though, right? Like we have this yeah. ADQ setup, and we are also supporting the sub functions, if that mm -hmm. is ideal for some scenarios. So, and that's true for uh, the ICE driver as well as the upcoming drivers. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh. Oh. I'm stopping the sharing. So the question is, how do you plan to orchestrate this configuration? Because the TC filters in there, they were matching on destination IP address from the pods, and then you are allocating queues for them, right? So who, mm -hmm. who would be mapping these? Oh, 
who is orchestrating yes, actually uh, there is a kubernetes device plugin that is being developed to enable this orchestration actually that is already available for our out of tree driver implementation uh, but the yeah it will be extended once this is upstream that plugin will be extended to support the uh, upstreaming way of configuring uh, configuring this polars so in the out of tree driver currently today we are using the devlink parameters as a, a way to configure the polars and uh, i think that will be not be acceptable upstream so that's why we are going with the rss context based configuration okay once thanks yeah okay thank you guys um uh, yeah shita can you go ahead and uh, start sharing yes sure uh can you guys hear me yeah okay cool uh let me just share one second uh um sorry give me one second um i'm sharing now let me know when you guys see it yeah it's coming yeah we can see okay cool um hi um i'm harshita ramamurthy uh, my colleague jake keller is also on this presentation hello. um sorry did you guys say something i just said hello oh hi yeah this is jake um so uh, our presentation today is going to be talking about uh, implementing um a uh, relatively recent uh, virtualization technology called scalable iov for the ice ethernet driver um we don't have a lot of slides uh, so we're going to be mostly uh, we want to present what the what you're doing and then sort of leave a lot of time for like feedback and discussion because we have a few proposals uh, that we want to get feedback on um so this is the agenda um so i'm going to give a quick uh, introduction on scalable iod as a whole for people who don't know and uh, talk about the ice driver refactor we did in preparation for um, also accommodating scalable iov on top of a uh, single route iov and then jake is going to talk about like the interesting stuff of like uh, what are the proposals we have um and um just to use a good slide um i basically took this off of one of my colleagues um but this is the overview of the intel scalable iov um uh, specification um the the problem with single route iov is that um we don't have a lot of scalability uh in terms of uh you know we when we do single route iov we create vfs uh, at one shot um and uh, that's sort of not very flexible we can't like add um vfs dynamically so scalable iov is supposed to enable that uh, where we can add vfs one by one and also um uh, we do need um so so the vfs are going to be um sort of flexible in terms of we can specify ultimately um in the next sort of iteration we want to specify the number of queues that could go into a vf so each vf can have different queues um so there is uh, i think we know like hardware assist uh, hardware assigned devices like single root iov and then we also have like software um uh uh created a uh, vfs uh, but a scalable iov sort of takes the best things of the both uh, of both approaches where we do have like a hardware um, isolation presented in the um uh, uh presented by the platform um and they and and these vfs are going to be um uh, isolated by something called passid uh, called a passid id so we do need like platform support for this um and um each vf is going to be tagged by a passid id and that's what it's going to give uh, like the hardware isolation um the, on the software side we do need something called um we we need a software resource remapping logic as indicated here in the uh slide uh, but that could be anything that could be spec uh, specific to the device itself uh that 
is doing scalable IOV. But basically what that does is it acts as um, the, it, it maybe emulates the PCI config space um, and uh, it allows the uh, driver or the VM to sort of talk to the hardware um, in by uh, splitting up the uh, resources in the hardware. Um, so as indicated here, the sort of unit um, with respect to the hardware at least is going to be called the assignable device interface. Uh, basically, it's just a set of queues, queue pairs, um, and they're tagged with a unique password. Um, and in the software side, uh, we uh, sort of compose these ADIs into virtual devices or VDEVs. Um, so they're sort of like VFs, but they don't have the you know the PCI register uh, the register space in the PCI config space, uh, but they are emulated in the software layer. Um, and this is, of course, uh, when we talk to the IOMMU layer, all these sort of interactions are tagged with the passing ID. Um, and coming to the driver refactor that we did, um, sort of um, um, the, the main thing that we did was create a, a new file called ice uh, underscore vf underscore lib dot c. Uh, these changes are already upstream, uh, but we, uh, in terms of SRIOV, we were sort of already storing the VFs in like arrays uh, because we used to get the number, uh, the number of VFs in the beginning itself, and we used to like allocate memory for it and then sort of do bookkeeping that way. But for this, since we are going to add VFs one by one, we had to convert the bookkeeping to like a, a hash table and um, uh, each um, and uh, we also um, made it dynamic that way and uh, we also introduced a struct called ice underscore vf underscore ops which basically um, uh, differentiates the different operations that we want to do uh, on single root uh, VFs and scalable VFs. So basically, uh, commonized uh, virtualization code in the ICE driver as much as possible. And uh, then um, just the differences were handled through these ops. Um, so I think th those are the main like bare bone things that we did. Um, and on top of this, um, we are going to build the actual like uh, scalable IOB functionality itself, and uh, Jake is going to talk about that now. Yeah, so as Harshi was saying, with single root, we create the VFs all at once, and they're part of the PCI spec, and they come with a bunch of baggage around the PCI configuration space and uh, things like that. The scalable IOV, in contrast, is a partially hardware and partially software device where the uh, slow path register accesses and things like that are uh, trapped and processed in software, and then they're they're translated into the appropriate action to take on the device. Whereas things like the queues and and other uh, stuff that's needed for the hot path is mapped through uh, IOMMU. There's work being done by some of our other colleagues. I think it's Kevin Tien and some other folks are working on improving the IOMMU interface with something called IOMMUFD, um, which is going to allow uh, creating the mappings that we need in the driver to to do this kind of partial mapping where some of the registers are mapped to, to uh, the, the IOMMU of the device and others are trapped in software. Um, there have been some presentations on that work at other conferences in the past. Um, that work is ongoing and we're expecting to see patches, more patches from that come through in the next few months. Uh, we're also looking, right now we're working on, in order to be able to create these devices, um, we wanna use DevLink to be able to basically say, please add a new port. Um, and then our goal is to uh, add a new DevLink port type. Um, given the similarity with these with subfunctions, uh, there's like a the DevLink ports have a flavor. We want to use the subfunction flavor, but with a different port type, um, where a regular subfunction would register and create a net dev and be able to be used in a host in a container. The scalable uh, type would allow you to create a, the VFIO device that you can then assign into like a QMU VM. And in our case with ICE, 
would to the VM represent the same interface as our IAVF uh, uh, single root virtual device um, with the ability to reuse that driver and the virt channel interface that we have for communication. Um, so uh, there are a couple of challenges we've seen with this approach that we don't have answers for. Um, one of which is that with single root, there's a whole bunch of net dev uh, hooks in place that allow you to configure things for VFs and perform certain behaviors. But when we've looked into that right now, they're pretty heavily tied to the like what the bus considers a VF. And so in PCI's case, um, it only like you have to set the single root number of VFs and it it's tied into that spec, which means that we can't really in the current way it works, we can't really use those interfaces. Um, so that's something we're trying to figure out what the best approach because our, our goal is to be able to keep using in the VM use cases with single root. We want to support those, but allow us to have more flexibility so that if you want to change one you know, virtual machine or you want to change one uh, VF settings, like change number of queues or change the total number of VFs, you don't have to tear down all of your other configurations and settings. Instead, you can just add or remove one at a time but uh, so those are kind of the two big things that we're trying to figure out is uh, with with our approach, we want to be able to add a port with DevLink and then assign its port type and have it bring up, which would then using Oxbus and an Aux device register with uh, with a driver that will handle the VFIO interactions to register with VFIO and create the, uh, the VDEV that you can assign with QMU. Um, and we still need to figure out how that'll tie into some of the NetDev VF infrastructure, or if that needs to be, if we need to find another approach to those spaces. Um, and we're, we're working on the next set of patches to actually have this support, um, but we don't currently have a timeline for when they can be posted yet. Um, so we're hoping to be able to get some discussion here with and answer people's questions or get feedback on some of this. Jake, this is Anjali. Uh, so what happens to the MDEV uh, proposal that was there? Do you still um, have to create the so, MDEV on the CISFS side or no? Right. So historically, we, we have been working on, on an approach using MDEV, um, but the kernel interfaces to work with that got removed because there were no drivers using it and communities moved towards uh, the VFIO with MMUFD. And with the new approach, when you create a dev link port and assign the port type and, and, and activate it, it will then communicate with what we're calling VDCM, which is the, the auxiliary driver that manages this. And that driver will register a new VFIO device automatically without needing to perform. So the only, the only interaction to, to add and bring the device up will be the uh, through dev link. And then you'll get a device object that you can assign to QEMU. Um, and we do have support currently for the MDEV approach in our out of tree, but given that it only works on old kernels, um, our long-term plan is to abandon that support once we once we get a workable solution in the upstream kernel. So um, I'm confused. What's the problem? That sounds like the right answer, right? I mean, basically what you're saying is you're going to create a device which looks like a VF as far as the rest of the Linux kernel is concerned, but this device is more composable. Um, right. That's, that's all it needs to be. I mean, in reality, though, that's the, I think the use case you're shooting for is not really interesting because either you're going to have a hypervisor that's got an ability to really control at the queue level, and the only real problem that you have to solve is the queue to IOMMU or uh, the requester ID mapping, which you're going to do through your VFIO binding to the yeah. FD. Once you've done that, the hypervisor that is queue aware is not actually looking for VFs anyway, right? I mean, that's why you're going down this direction. If you are doing VF management, then you're fine, right? You're get, going to get what you're going to get. So that the use case that I think you started out with saying you want to go address, I'm saying, don't even worry about that. Actually go for that maximal per queue assignment for the people who really want queue granularity 
and go for the VF assignment, leave the VF assignment the way it is today. And I think your bridge sounds pretty good. Anybody disagree? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm reasonable. <laughs> yeah, it's reasonable. I mean, not uh, sure I quite follow that exactly, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, which part, which buzzword do you want to unpack? <laughs> um. So right. So I mean, the the kind of use case here is to be able to take the existing virtualization we have and kind of reuse the VM side of things, but make the PF side a little bit more able to be. Uh, that's exactly it, right? Expanded out, right? But, well, so that's what I'm saying. There are two ways you can think about this, right? One is what you just said, which is I'm going to effectively create the notion of, let's say there was something called a super VF for the sake of mm -hmm. argument. And you did a one-to-one -one mapping in the SRIV case to a real VF. And in the case that you're going to run with SRIV, you could basically construct the VF that you want and assign it to the super VF because the underlying VF is not really a PCI construct. It's whatever you wanted it to be. And right. these queues are just grouped by their IOMMU key, the request ID, right? That's right. the only real grouping they have. Um, and that's what I think you're talking about as a way to keep the upper level intact and keep going in this direction. What I'm saying is that when you start thinking about queue-based management as opposed to physical PCI device-based management, your hypervisor is going to have to evolve. It cannot. It really doesn't want to be a thing that sees a bunch of PCI devices at PCI scan time and then figures things out because there's... Actually, I, I take a previous sentence back. There are two groupings you have to worry about. One is the grouping of the queues to the IOMMU. The other is the grouping of the queues to your physical port on the network side. Right. Right. Those are the only two groupings you care about. And the hypervisor is better equipped to manage that than any middleware layer you can come up with. I'll pause for that sentence and see if people agree with that. Because if that's if you agree with that, then trying to build a middleware translation library doesn't make any sense. Why not just go from uh, DivLink port directly to VFIO and... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Don't have a middleware of yeah. any kind of grouping. It doesn't make sense because True. the hypervisor is... Yeah, is uh, it makes sense you, to yeah. me, yeah. That was all I had to say. Yeah, so uh, any more questions? Jake, the VDCM that you talked about, is it part of the PF driver or you're trying to create something that sits in under the VFIO PCI subsystem? Um, it's essentially part of the PF driver right now with the goal being to just kind of keep it isolated in order to provide better abstraction for uh, keeping some of the pieces from interfering. Because if we, if we build everything directly in, um, we already have a lot of logic that makes that kind of challenging. Um, but essentially what it's doing is basically taking the, the queue blocks that we have, the ADIs and, and talking to VFIO to say, here's a, here's a, you know, VF device. Um, yeah. One of the things that, I mean, uh, I don't know how you guys have, um, isolated this VDCM out. But if it is running on the AUX device, that might be a good way to isolate it and not run it as part of the PF driver itself and leave the PF driver as the PCI driver and the data plane driver, not so much you know, also acquiring the functionality, which was being, uh, in some cases, is being done by your device uh, for resource management for, say, SR, you know, similar to what was happening on SRIV side. I mean, the reason I kind of say that is Going forward, it would make sense that this VDCM is actually sitting in the VFIO PCIe subsystem rather than with the PF driver, because it has got nothing to do with the data plane driver. So, yeah, right now it's the design we have is fairly isolated and self-contained. Although we're still in progress with trying to to move it from what we have into an AUX device, AUX driver model. So that's uh, work we're still working on. 
Well, if nothing else, it, it becomes a matter of separating the PF from the network function is basically what it comes down to is you have the PCIe interface, yep. you have whatever bookkeeping you're having to do to maintain the uh, all the existing requests for uh, uh, MDEVs ADI. or ADIs. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They're still going to have to go through an MDEV function to get into the, or is that going through the VFIO? Um, that's that's going into the VFIO side, right? So we okay. will have, um, I'm not yeah. sh exactly sure the specifics because we're still looking at the, uh, the how, how the changes are going out, but essentially uh, VFIO is handling the actual like composing there. And then the IOMMU FD is the, is the, uh, new hooks to actually get the pass in and and those pieces together and do the do the partial memory maps where we have sparse mapping for the hardware queue resources yeah but anyway what i was getting at is essentially yeah you're going to end up needing to split the pf up and most likely just have a a logic there just for doing the bookkeeping keeping track of what interrupts belong to who what queues belong to who and when you know it, yeah it just becomes a, a lot instead of having all the management done it becomes more the bookkeeping has to be done just to make sure you didn't exceed your resources and whatnot otherwise right. yeah you're better off just farming out the what sizes uh are being requested and such to some other entity right yeah. and i know we have um some work going on for for the sub function work to do with uh net dev sub functions that were kind of tying into that's being published soon that's going to be very similar with that kind of split where the where the sub function stuff will move the the net dev aspect into its into an aux driver yeah and um, the out of tree uh, implementation we have right now with the mdev um, so, uh, mdev framework the vdcm module uh, in that implementation, what it basically does is it just has like a pointer to the VSI or the the hardware level ADI, right? Uh, it has a pointer to that and it uh, just does the talking to the MDEV framework. That's basically all it does. It's just like this shim layer with very yeah. little like bookkeeping and talking to the kernel interfaces. Uh, so we have to basically, whatever that is going to be in the newer implementation, which is IOM, IOMMUFD, we are just going to do that um, in the newer implementation. OK, uh, we ran out of time, so we have to move on to the next talk. Uh, any more questions, comments? Great, then uh, let's move on. Uh, Thanks, Simon, guys. you're up. Thanks, uh, guys. Thanks. Uh, uh, hi. Yep. So, share <clears throat> screen and. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I'm just sharing. Okay, do you, do you see it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, do you still see it? Okay. Uh, so I'm Simon. Uh, I work for Corrigan on the NFP driver. Uh, I work for Corrigan, and we have an NFP driver. I'll just give a quick background. The uh, NFP is a, a programmable networking chip. Uh, it was developed by Netrino, who I previously worked for, at the current development of both the chip and the driver are mainly driven by Corrigan these days. Okay, so my topic will be not quite as in-depth as, uh, as the other ones, but uh, let's get going. Um, so I just wanted to, to cover some recent developments in the driver, which might be of interest to the group. Um, so there's going to be, be, be two main topics, which is the support for the new chip, and then the flexible VFQ assignment, which, which actually is sim somehow related to the previous topics. I hope we can get a little bit of discussion on that, and then just briefly some other recent highlights. Uh, so one of the most significant changes we've made to the driver in the last year is to add uh, support for a new chip. Uh, so uh, this, this chip is designed for 10G and 25G use cases, typically uh, dual port. Um, it's a successor to the chip that was previously exclusively supported by the driver, which is the, the 6000, the 4000, which are, are 
closely related to each other. Uh, it's the 3800 is in the same family. It has many of the same features. It has uh, several improvements. Uh, it is a lower end chip. It has a uh, fewer processing units, but because of the improvements, it, it is actually uh, quite high performance. Um, so on the driver side, uh, the main changes, there are many changes, but the main changes is firstly the abstraction to allow uh, the driver to support uh, various different uh, uh, aspects of a chip because it, the chip this, this chip is different to the previous ones, for example, register layouts and so on. Uh, that was not so complicated. Um, and then the, the really the biggest change is we have what we call a data path. This is a very heavily overloaded term, but what this means is a way that the NIC and the host communicate with each other over the PCIe bus. These are different. Um, so we now have two. We have uh, the old one, which is called NFT3. Of course, there was NFT1 and 2, but that was never part of the driver. And NFTK, where K, uh, the, the internal code name for the chip relates to K. Um, and uh, the major change there is that uh, on TX, we can use multiple descriptors, uh, which is obviously leads to, to some performance uh, improvements. Uh, the status of this is, is it is upstream. Um, and mostly the feature coverage is the same for, for all of these chips now, which is nice. Both the NFTK and the NFT3 versions support the same features and so for, for both types of chips. And this has been the case since 5.18. Okay, so the next topic, uh, which is the one I was hoping there will be some discussion on. Uh, so we just had a presentation from Intel about SRV. Uh, this is also about SRV, but we are not trying to create a, a new, more flexible type of SRV, although I think that is an excellent idea. Uh, we, we just want to make the current uh, SRV a bit, little bit more configurable. And in particular, what we would like to do is to be able to configure at, at the time or just before the VFs are instantiated, how many uh, queues will be assigned to each VF. But not in a simple way, we're, well, in a simple way, but rather than being able to just say each queue, sorry, each uh, VF will have four queues, for example, or eight queues or whatever, um, we would like to say something like, you know, we would like two VFs with 16 queues and four VFs with eight queues and all the other VFs to have four queues or, or whatever. Uh, probably in powers of two because that makes sense, but not necessary. So, uh, we, we have this working. Uh, we posted a patch set uh, recently, I think it was last week. Um, and in this, we used a generic dev link interface. So the patch was not written by me, but it was my idea. So you can blame me for that. Um, and it looks a bit like this. Um, so some of the feedback that was uh, received is firstly that this 24122 string looks very vendor specific. I it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to just represent two with 16, four with eight, 122 with, <clears throat> with four and zero with two. I see I missed up the string, but anyway, it's supposed to be generic, um, but it is cryptic. We can agree on that. So Jakob uh, Kaczynski, who's one of the NetDev maintainers, suggests using the DevLink resource API. And then I noticed that Saeed mentioned uh, within the last 24 hours, using uh, the DevLink port API. And then I noticed there was some more conversation on the mailing list after I finalized my slides, going back and forwards on that. But it seems to me that sort of the crux of this discussion is, is sort of what is um, what is the granularity of the resource. So, so clearly the number of queues is a port property in one sense, but in another sense, it's a higher level property because for example, there's only a certain number of uh, queues available for the device. Um, and also probably this, well, at least in the case of, of our hardware, we need to know this before the VFs are instantiated. And so that makes it difficult to use the DevLink port API. Um, so actually maybe I take a break now. So, so you do, you, do you have any feedback on this? Yeah, so DevLink port API should be used when the VF is still unbound to the VM. That's the whole point of it. So you yep. can uh, 
configure it before you actually uh, so I think that, yeah so I think we would certainly do it before uh, binding the VF? Bind it, bind it. But it, I think the, the issue from our side, if I understood my, my developer, is we need to know before we instantiate it on the card. Um, OK. Then this is not the API. So yeah. So in that yeah. case, I think perhaps the, the resource API makes more sense because it's a chip-wide thing. Uh, yeah, in both cases, chip wide. But I think uh, relating back to the SIUV and uh, all the uh, sub function talks, it's eventually going to be needed to have some sort of controllability and uh, configurability for these dynamic functions to be controlled in a single spot where it's not the like a resource API. It should be specific. API specific for these functions. And uh, I know here you have some hardware limitation, but I, I think you should try to reconsider, see if you can do something in your firmware device yep. uh, where you can support it dynamically, these changes, even uh, yeah. when the VF is unbound. OK. I can, uh, yeah, I can't answer that question. I'm sorry, but I can certainly talk to the developers yeah. and see if that's possible. So we already have today, like, I think, two, three parameters in the port function. I mean, this is the way you set the hardware address, uh, MAC address for uh, the VF. Yep. So, yeah, should look into that. Okay. Okay. I, I will. Uh, we will talk about this more. That yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So this will be a quick presentation. Uh, the last slide is, is quite brief. Uh, so just some other things we have or, or are working on. Um, so IPsec hardware offload, this was posted in the 6.1 timeframe. Uh, there was a few problems with it. Um, and uh, we're, we're brushing that up. Uh, I, I expect to post that again soon. Uh, so we are targeting the, the 6.2 release. Uh, I, I forgot to mention for the previous feature, we're also targeting 6.2, but there seems to be a bit more discussion of it than I expected, so I'm not less sure about that one. Um, and then on the OBS TC hardware offload, which those familiar with my work is actually sort of one of my main focuses in the past, um, we added a feature whereby the, when you have a la lag net dev, which is part of the OBS bridge, uh, you can put the IP address on the lag. Uh, so this is for as a tunnel endpoint. Um, whereas previously the IP address needed to reside on the bridge, uh, which which is still supported. Um, and then we also added uh, hardware offload support for SNAT and DNAT, which is related to contract. Uh, so we already had support for contract, but uh, not this uh, particular sub part of it. And that was included in the, the most recent release, 6.1. So that is everything I had today. Thank you very much for your time. Great, thanks, Simon. Uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks Simon. Uh, just give me a moment. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Next one, oh, it will be me. So uh, let me share my screen first. I asked already. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Any questions online? So, yeah. How do you envision configuring your individual devices, e.g., VF configs through PFs native using IP? Uh, do you mean here IP route? I think that's what it is. You can put it on the screen. Okay. It's, it's not? Uh, yeah, click on that. Uh, what? Yeah. Okay, got it. Show on stage. Yeah. So I think this question is for uh, which talk? Uh, your individual device, VF. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I guess we address that using uh, div link port function. Uh, Configs meaning like MAC address, stuff like uh, 
seems like that range. Yeah, but perhaps the question is getting at, I think, a pre route or already a support setting a minimal number of configurations via the PF, such as the MAC address. Yeah, IP is uh, legacy. We try not to use it IP route and. Uh, Like, is that him talking? No, that's Simon's. Yeah, it, my question okay. was originally for Jake on the, uh, the Intel um, devices, how they were how they were doing it. But it but it uh, does apply for uh, for Simon's as well. How how do we want to be configuring these devices? How do we want to set up the configuration before we instantiate the device? I, I, I suppose that it won't ever. So yeah, ideally, as we as I suggested, as we already have in, uh, in Mellanox devices, where before you bind the VF, you just uh, do the div link uh, port command, and you have attributes uh, for that port. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Yeah, the the dev link interface has a nice way to you can add you can add a port, and then you can configure it, and then and then there's a follow-up stage to actually activate. And it's not until the activate stage that you would actually like bind the VF to anything or, or whatnot. And so that's the same place we're investigating to do this as well. So I think we're kind of aligned on that. Yeah. So the model is like create, uh, configure, and then deploy. Yeah, I think this will work well for uh, scalable IOV or sub functions. But SRIOV, uh, the problem is we create all these functions using the echo command. That itself will create all these. By that time, we need to know that how many resources we can allocate to each of these VFs. Uh, yeah, not really, been the uh, or challenge. Uh, Shridhar, so when you do the echo to SysFS, you are just creating the PCI devices for the VF, SRIV. You're really not creating your, uh, you know, the network device. And so you still have time to go ahead and do this configuration, save the configuration on the PF side, and use that when your VM comes up, the VM driver comes up, to kind of give it the right amount of resources. So I think what uh, you know, uh, Saeed is uh, suggesting is workable for SRIV as well. Yeah. Yeah, we need to look at it. Uh, yeah. Would that use the PCI? Uh, VF flavor uh, to talk to the SRIUV VF? Anjali, is that what you're suggesting? I'm just saying that your uh, dev link, when you do the config port, you're getting information about your network resources that you're going to, or DMA resources that you're going to give to your VF. And at that time, your VF driver is not loaded. You are, uh, you've just created your SRIUV VF PCIe devices through Echo. So you have all the time to kind of, you know, get the configuration in the on the PF side. So when the VM uh, VF driver loads, you can restrict it to the right amount of resources. Particularly in our case, since we negotiate everything, so it's easier. Okay. Uh, possibly a crazy idea, but potentially could you not create uh, devlink port objects based on SRIOV total VFs instead of SRIOV num VFs, so that then you can have them all configured before you echo to SRIOV num VFs? Well, that will create a lot of clutter in the devlink level. Yeah, for no reason. Okay, moving on. So uh, my next talk is exactly about this, customization of uh, devices and uh, called firmware-centric devices since the, oh, I'm not sharing, I'm sorry. Uh... Actually, I was. Oh, you need to close the uh, yeah. Okay, got it. Got it, got it. Thanks. So do, do, do this one. So yeah, uh, talk about firmware-centric devices. Basically, all modern devices are firmware-centric. Uh, they're growing up in uh, 
complexity as we been already talking about uh, SIOV, sub functions, smart NICs, and whatnot. And uh, we need a way to configure these devices and uh, um, customize them for uh, the specific need or specific use case. Um, so I'm going to run quickly due to uh, lack of time. But uh, again, uh, multitude of features managed by the firmware driver and uh, users simply don't want all the features all the time, uh, especially when you have uh, high scale systems like SRV or uh, SRIV and uh, sub functions where you want to load function for a specific purpose and you don't want to give that functions all of the hardware abilities. And uh, in many cases, in many hardware uh, generations, there are uh, some conflicts between these features. You cannot just have all of them working uh, in harmony uh, with no issues. So uh, user intervention is required to configure and uh, customize the specific device. I have an example here for Connectix devices, how how uh, quickly they uh, add more and more uh, knobs, like NVconfigs. So we have around 600 NVconfigs today. And the only way to configure, they are, so dev these devices are highly, highly configurable. The problem is that they're not flexible, meaning you can configure them, but it's, uh, it's very hard to know how to configure and when to configure. And uh, many users need different uh, combination of features in boot time and what is the most efficient configuration. And uh, standard tools today like ETHOOL or IP uh, route or DevLink can go only so far, but you still sometimes need the vendor specific tools and uh, knobs to get the uh, maximum out of, your, uh, out of the hardware that you're working on. So yeah, today I think all vendors agree that they have their own toolboxes that they need uh, to download and run in the specific system to customize for specific use case. And these tools usually they require uh, direct user space access to the PCI, which is a no-no for uh, secure boot systems. Uh, proprietary kernel modules, same thing. No uh, in production, no in a secure boot system. So, and a uh, long turnaround cycle, when you have a bug report, gonna ask the customer to download the tool and then un until they download it and know how to run it and read the documentation and everything, it's too, uh, it's too late. So we're trying to find a solution for such issues. And uh, uh, here quickly, we can discuss the types of uh, dials and knobs that uh, needed. So basically our functionality, disable, enable, or select a, like a subset of features you want to enable in a specific device, performance, uh, parameters, and values, and ranges, and uh, debuggability, like trigger, monitor, and capture uh, rust type features. There are different categories for uh, these parameters. Mostly the most important one is the non-volatile, which always require a, a vendor tool uh, to configure the firmware uh, statically uh, to do a specific function uh, or change the firmware to, do, uh, to behave differently from the out-of-the-box configuration. A volatile device global firmware configuration, the one uh, Simon was talking about. You want to configure a um, specific attribute for a NSF or VF or a global uh, device attribute. Or volatile per function, sorry, this is the one that uh, Simon was talking about, where you want to uh, divide the resources differently between the different uh, sub functions. Um, and the last one is the uh, debuggability and debug uh, types of features. So uh, we already have some upstream APIs that can answer many of these questions. We have DevLink, DevLink parameters, and DevLink port functions, which we just discussed. And uh, for debuggability, we have the DevLink health and DevLink resources. 
So let's talk about the first category, which is non-volatile uh, and volatile uh, NIC customization type of parameters. So as I said, we already have like uh, div link params that can address all gl uh, global uh, volatile, non volatile, volatile, non volatile uh, type of parameters. The problem is uh, there are two types of parameters we can push there. There are standard parameters and uh, non standard, meaning uh, vendor specific. And it, one of the problems that we need to get to an agreement what is what is driver specific and what is not. And this is a big problem today. And the whole DevLink parameters area is not utilized because we cannot get into agreement on what should go there and what not. And uh, it requires like uh, a lot of effort, lot of, lot of uh, brainstorming of when a parameter should go there and when it's not. So today, only a small subset of uh, the, so first of all, small uh, the amount of devices that implement DevLink parameters is very small. I think it's three or four vendors today and each one has like three or four parameters so uh, that territory is really not uh, explored and not utilized that's one problem and the other type is the uh, vol type function configuration with shannon just ask a question how do you configure and the answer is uh, divlink port function but same issue with the divlink parameters uh, it's hard to agree what is a standard Parameter was not so. I highly recommend all other vendors to come into. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, let's uh, sit down and decide what should go there, what not. And I, I highly recommend that we all agree that uh, non-standard uh, and uh, vendor-specific parameters should belong to DevLink params and per-function params. So even if you have like you can set the queue length set the queue size, divide the MSI X vectors and everything. Sometimes you still have some vendor specific features that you want to turn on and off on a specific uh, function. Uh, RAS features, so we have many tools. Again, not explored territory. Uh, I recommend all vendors to go ahead and uh, look at it, implement whatever they can implement. Uh, it's highly recommended. Uh, the problem is that we can, uh, today we implement in NVIDIA many of those. The problem, it's not standardized, meaning not all vendors implement this. So it's hard to go to the customer saying, hey, this is the standard. You should use it. You should uh, 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 invest some time to develop it in your uh, deployment uh, environment. But they say, no, other vendors, they don't use it. So we're, we're not going to go this route. Um, uh, another idea is to have vendor extensions where you don't, so every time you need to add a, a debuggability feature or a new knob, you'll have to uh, um, upgrade the kernel, which is usually uh, something that is not uh, welcome. And uh, you need to wait a couple of years until the, uh, this specific kernels land in all the distros to get the knob or the configurability, configurability options so your users can use it. So many approaches, they use a vendor extension where they define a standard, like NVMe CLI has a standard, and you can plug in uh, some use, uh, vendor-specific modules that will extend the functionality of NVMe CLI. So this is something that we should explore. Maybe we can uh, add some uh, do some extensions to DevLink, so we will have similar um, mechanism. And uh, that's it. So to summarize uh, today, even with uh, all the options and uh, DevLink uh, stuff that I just explored, we're still not there. Um, and also, there's an, some embargo in DevLink parameters. As I explained, every time we push up parameters, someone says, no, this is not center. This is, doesn't belong here or there. And um, I, I'm, I'm very sure that kernel admins, developers, testers, and uh, also vendors, they will be happy to have such approach in the kernel where 
you don't need to download any uh, external tools just to experiment with some specific feature uh, in the hardware. So that's it. Uh, any questions? Actually, it's not a question. Your uh, first summary slide, so Nick attestation is still immature. Do expand. And uh, and maybe I'll set up the IDPF conversation already. What happens in the multi-host case? Like Nick attestation is a real problem. Your yeah. firmware thing also is a real problem. If I have four hosts, this problem gets yeah. much worse. Well, let's talk about one host, which is yeah. where we have a problem. No, no, I'm, I'm already setting it up for the next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, <laughs> let's solve it for one host, and then I'm, uh, I'll be happy to to expand. So, yeah, the problem with the NIC attestation, I mean, we get a call from a customer, we have a bug. I do, yeah, let's run devlink hell, devlink commands, get some output, send it to my firmware guys. Yeah, not enough. Go download the tools again. I mean, yeah, we have the tools, just they're not uh, utilized. That, that's a problem. We have the interfaces, we have the everything, just we still need the tools because that's a mindset. All vendors, they come with their own tools and they, the firmware teams and the tools teams are different from the upstream team. And we're, we're trying to change that internally, but I'm trying to, uh, to reach to other vendors to do that themselves. So to uh, educate their tools and firmware teams that, hey, we have upstream APIs, mainstream tools that we can utilize instead of writing our own in-house stuff. Does that answer your question? Uh, to, to a, to a extent, um, yeah, are you getting any success there? A little bit. In-house. Uh, with customers, no. And we're trying to change that. Uh, any, any other so, uh, Mike? Okay. Yeah. Is is any other vendor? What is the question? Any other vendor, the person next to me said no. <laughs> okay. Any other vendors, and then the person next to me said no. <laughs> At least the remote people can. Oh, that, that should resolve it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Said, why why is this is this objectable? What, what are people objecting to this proposal you have? Or? Uh, other than. Uh, Mailing list reviews that we always get, uh, you know, some pushback and when pushing some of these of sort of vendor specific stuff. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, the only thing that could help here is that uh, other vendors should participate and uh, push their own, you know, uh, agenda to this uh, cause. Yeah, I know yeah. we have work ongoing to extend to use more of the interfaces like health and and resources. Part of it is just that uh, a lot of it is if you have a driver that's not designed around doing it from the start and then refactoring existing code to fit into those interfaces can be quite a challenge and end up lower on the priority list from other feature work. <laughs> yeah. OK, I'm going to take Shrijit's bait. Uh, so why do we need these devlink knobs? Why not a config file? Because configuration is like thousands of knobs. How many knobs are we going to invent? Yeah. So imagine you have like uh, this uh, uh, virtualization environment you want to spin off right now in a, a SIUV function. Configuration file can only like, you cannot describe exactly what the customer wants with this function. Yeah, so I mean, I, I can tell you what I mean, it's dynamic. Our, you cannot just push it like in an NV config somewhere and that forget about it. It has to be dynamic. There are, there are two parts. Like if you split initially, you're deploying for a given server. You have certain things that you would have decided, like whether you're going to enable SRIV or not, whether you're going to enable SIOV or whether you're going to not enable any virtualization because maybe Facebook like use case or something, right? Those things, definitely all of those. And there are hundreds such knobs in, in a device because, you know, um, our, our devices have become like, a, you know, um, it's, it's like requirements coming from 
you know, 100 different customers. So we support five different forms of virtualization. We support, you know, uh, multi-host and multi-home and XYZ and everything. And it's not like everybody is deploying all those features. So configuring, at least in the DPU, IPU world, where you said it's very firmware centric, I, I really think you need to think about it as to like your um, profiling your node as to like what it is going to do. And that's a huge configuration file that you should be able to um, give it to your firmware upfront, which kind of binds your, it gives you upper boundaries of, and yes, no answers for what this node is being used for. Uh, and then rest of it, you know, when your VM is up or something, you do negotiate, but you're negotiating on those boundaries. It's not going beyond those, right? So as long as your driver is written to negotiate certain features and your firmware is able to kind of do the policy enforcement, I think you have a solution. How do you pass the file? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very good question. So the question is, how do you pass the so, file? So uh, I think we should move on and take this, uh, yeah, this offline. Yeah, I see. So. All right. So the to the remote business, the question, the comment was, it's a can of worms, and then somebody says, the point of the workshop is to open that can of worms. I mean, we can stay after the next talk, and then yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, Willem, you're up. Hey, everybody. Uh, okay. Let me share my screen. Um, thanks. So this is a session about uh, some standardization at the um, driver level of network cards for um, specifically for hyperscale deployments, so for, for large data centers. Um, this was a started a year ago by Meta and Google at uh, the Open Compute Project uh, Global Summit. Last week was another global summit. It's our annual shindig um, in San Jose. Um, so we gave an update there. So let me give a, an introduction. Like, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Um, so first, um, what are we doing? So it's really an opportunity for. Um, hyperscale providers to share it with uh, vendors what is it that we need from network cards and um, to to come up with a, a shared understanding of, of the feature set um, purely sort of selfishly uh, I've been at Google for quite a while I've seen multiple generations of network cards from various vendors and um, integrating each individual network card is always a whole new process where uh, we have to qualify the network card that it behaves the way we want it. Um, we have one-on-one -on -one conversations with vendors um, on, on what we need under NDA. This is um, fairly slow and, and, and painful. Um, so <laughs> we'd like to avoid that. I think it's better for the whole ecosystem um, to, to, to share an understanding of our workloads and to basically codify how these things really are expected to work. Um, so. Initially, we're focusing on what's known as the, um, sort of the core features, the things you expect a, a server-grade network card to have, so stateless offloads, checksum offload, um, segmentation offload. Uh, tunneling is a feature that's you know, widely used in um, hyperscale deployments for when you host untrusted virtual users or when um, handling uh, untrusted packets coming from the public internet. There's additional a lot of nested tunneling um, and a combination of things like um, you know, IPv4 to IPv6 translation, um, untrusted user traffic, um, some kind of hop-by-hop -hop routing, MPLS tags. So um, for, on the tunneling part specifically, um, what I think is relevant to these workloads is that we're like a, a closed world, so we don't have to play by the rules of the public internet, and, and thus we don't. So a lot of these protocols can be either custom protocols or just custom variants, um, and I'll get to why this is relevant. Um, and then maybe the lowest of low-hanging fruits is telemetry. At our scale, um, at this scale, we need... Uh, distributed automated monitoring, which you know at the bottom plugs into the counters of a device. And in Linux network devices, um, telemetry is a bit of a wild west. Right? There's basically the RTML um, 
um, 64 uh, counters for packet and byte count. And even there, you can't be entirely sure which bytes a byte counter counts. Like, is it for a TSO packet? Is it the packet that the NIC receives, or is it the bytes on the wire? Um, and then there's a whole bunch of counters under when you call eTool capital S on a device, which are device specific, uh, which are generally not very well documented. Different devices may support the same feature under a different name. Uh, more insidious is if the same counter exists, but it actually has different behavior. Um, so we'd like at the very least some clarity there. Um, and also to you know communicate which counters are important to us that may not be entirely obvious. But one that's very important is what we detect in, in cast. So when a, a network card drops back at somewhere in its receive path, because the host is not keeping up usually the host interface function, um, that's a, um, a strong signal for us. Um, um, RSS scaling is important. And then um, we get to the more interesting uh, sort of features, the more advanced features. So encryption, inline encryption offload, Google, uh, about half a year ago, I think, open sourced, um, or at least shared publicly, I should say. It's PSP, inline crypto protocol on uh, github.com, Google PSP. Um, we are committed to this. We have an interest in, uh, well, you know, any card we buy will have to support this, but we also have an interest in, in sharing this more broadly. Um, so it should basically not be just, you know, Intel spec. It, it would be better if this is an industry spec. Um, so, we're also excluding things. I don't want to write the world's biggest spec. Um, so specifically, a lot of the things that we've talked about so far today, which are fairly bleeding edge and um, haven't been, haven't crystallized entirely, um, uh, what would be an, e uh, an industry standard, um, are out of spec. No IPUs, DPUs, smart NICs, um, most of the virtualization features, I think we're talking about SIOV and so are excluded. Uh, we're really focusing on the core features that are hopefully uncontroversial, that everyone agrees how they work, um, and we should get them out of the way for once and for all. And the target for these deployments, unsurprisingly, are kind of you know, high-end servers. They're not necessarily the most exotic machines. That's not what data centers um, are, are filled with, but they are very high-end. And the goal is for if you write a spec, that it will be you know, uh, relevant for a, a generation, an order of magnitude, let's say a decade, with only minor revision. So we're not targeting one specific platform, but you know, 200, 400, 800 gigs uh, for sure. Um, and um, Linux. So I said this is at Open Compute Platform, which is mostly a hardware-oriented, uh, I, I would say, uh, standardization environment. Um, so doing pure software is, is a bit on the edge of what they do. Um, we're targeting Linux because that's what we use. Uh, obviously, you know, others like Netflix use FreeBSD, there are Windows servers. So I think that's a little bit of a blind spot for us um, and where we're very open to getting others to contribute with a different view. But since this is NetDefConf, I will not, you know, I think Linux is what we all know and, 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 and work on, so that's good. So why even bother with standardization? Right? Um, I'll get you know three examples that even the most simple simple features that we all agree how they work. Once you actually start looking closely, we don't agree how they work, and they they tend to tend being tend to be subtly different, uh, which uh, causes a lot of pain when we have to um, introduce a new network card to our uh, environment. I gave the telem telemetry example. There's a lot of glue code in our in our um, user space logic to handle all the diversity of, of what vendors um, expose through counters. Um, yeah. Um, then there is uh, I've seen multiple network cards have a subtle misbehavior in the checksumming, which is you know the most basic offload I think. So very simply checksumming. Obviously, you just sum the packet. And um, then on transmit, take the if if you do signed logic, which is easier to explain, you take the negative of the sum, put it in the checksum field, and now if you sum it again, it has to sum up to zero. Um, we do young, use once complement uh, logic, uh, once complement arithmetic here, which which to negate a value to create the complement, you flip all the bits. The, Corollary of this is that every uh, number has a um, a, a uh, complement, including zero. So there's a positive zero and a negative zero. And in TCP, these are essentially equivalent. So uh, zero and FFFF are the same. Uh, the UDP RFC um, 
decided to be a very, very smart here and said, you know what, if we have two values of zero, let's reserve one to denote this packet has not been checksummed, which is all zeros, versus this checksum adds up to zero, which is FFFF. Um, fairly subtle protocol a quirk that um, requires just, you know, one extra step in hardware to implement. Um, and as I said, I've seen it a couple of times that, that it was glossed over. So there's really no reason for that. And then finally, um, the misunderstandings, I think, between users and, and vendors. Um, I gave the tunnel example where we really care about um, protocol independent offloads where possible. Um, years ago, I think Tom Herbert here at NetDev gave a talk about protocol ossification and how we should have protocol independent offloads. So this is, this is probably not news to people here. But, um, you know, a network card that comes on the box with supports Geneve, supports VXLAN is fairly useless to us uh, because we will be running, even if we would be running Geneve, it would be G Geneve with some weird Google quirk to it. Um, so um, I think we should do a better job at explaining how we use hardware and what we need from hardware. Um, and it shouldn't be, this is what you need to sell to Google. This is uh, probably a uh, um, most... Um, deployments at this scale have the same kind of the same kind of requirements. Um, so why are we trying to you know go to standardization? I think I explained um, the the issues we've seen in the past. So we like to share um, this knowledge of, of our workloads and also the subtle points of protocols and so and write this down once and for all and and, and have the, you know industry uh, feedback on it so that it's we don't have blind spots just because this is one way of how Google does it. Um, to get to this common understanding, um, free from NDAs. So instead of having these one-on-one -on -one conversations between every pair of potential user and vendor uh, for every generation of NIC under NDA, um, let's just say, okay, this is how the basics of a network card should work. Uh, we all agree on this. Let's let's move out, move on. And this move on is is a key part of this. Instead of having the same conversations over and over again, um, I think we all would like to focus on exciting new efforts. And uh, last but not least, we're not only trying to write a, a spec, just a document, um, but um, have this spec point to how to test for conformance for certain features and have these tests publicly available. So um, we've um, upstreamed a bunch of Google's internal NIC conformance tests are under tools testing self test net. Um, and uh, this way, um, we hope to sort of build a, an industry conformance test suite. Like the first tests that we upstreamed are, are nowhere near, you know, complete or perfect. Uh, that's not the point, but at least uh, uh, it's a starting point and it allows us to, uh, to work with the vendor and say, hey, this feature isn't working out the way we expect. Can you run this, this exact test and, and see if you can reproduce it? Uh, I've, I've found in the past myself that without such a shared um, test, it's very hard to, uh, to debug on both sides of, of two organizations. Um, so we're focusing on the core features and um, I'll also introduce one of the slightly more advanced features. I think this, this is all uh, well known to the NetDev community. Uh, so I'll be pretty brief here that, um, as I said, we care about protocol and independence. Uh, there are really two ways to do checksum offload, which is, you know, the, the host passes a packet to a device uh, on transmit and the device finds the start of the TCP header, clears a checksum field, fills in the checksum, sends it out. Um, or there's a generic version where um, the host passes the packet and passes an offset from where to start a linear sum and an, and an offset where to put this sum. And the device doesn't need to know that it's TCP or UDP or GRE or whatever once complement checksum we, we have. Um, so we have a strong preference for the second. I think that should be the standard for Linux devices by now. Uh, but um, maybe less in this community, but more broader in uh, communities that are not this Linux specific. It, it, that needs to be repeated. Um, and one feature that um, is uh, in, in um, the kernel documentation, local checksum offload, makes use of this feature that if, if you know that once a packet goes out, the inner sum 
is hardware offloaded, then by definition, the in, inner bytes will sum up to zero. Um, so even if you have a complicated packet with multiple levels of nesting and, and you know, MPLS tags and such, then uh, the device will not choke on this because it cannot parse it. Um, the host can in insert the other checksums needed very cheaply because it doesn't have to check some old bytes of payload to compute the outer UDP checksum. By definition, the inner checksum is zero, um, you know, bar the pseudo header. Um, so the outer checksum is really only over the header. And you can do this any number of times. It's not even limited to one layer of, of NCAP. So this is, this is what we really want to see. Um, uh, and this goes into a slight other point, which is like network devices with fixed um, pipelines, uh, fixed parsers would probably choke on a packet like this. You know, if nothing else, the number of MPLS tags is, you know, variable and MPLS doesn't have a next header field. So really there's no way to parse this thing unless you have this business logic. But um, a programmable uh, parser allows an administrator to basically update the parser on the NIC and now the NIC can parse the packet that the host just built. You know, that is still strictly worse than a protocol in independent um, implementation. And the reason for this is it leads to correlated rollouts. Like if, if we want to roll out a new version of a protocol, of an encapsulation protocol, then we first have to roll out a new version of the firmware to all the machines in our fleet, which is a relatively slow process if you want to do this safely. Um, and then the new feature, and if something goes wrong, we have to roll back and we have correlated roll, but roll out some rollbacks and it's slow and it's painful and it's error prone. Um, so, you know, smarts in that sense are actually worse than not needing smarts at all. Um, slightly more uh, advanced topic, which um, I think is very topical right now is, is using time, using a precision time protocol. So operations at the microsecond scale or potentially you know, hundreds of nanosecond scale. This um, is reasonably well supported by network cards like Linux PTP, the software API. And so is very, I think very mature as a time stamping. Um, the only thing I really want to add here is that um, the offload of hardware timestamping to um, timestamp a back at the moment it arrives at the network card at the phi and also timestamp the moment it leaves as close to the phi as possible is, uh, is I think often implemented specifically for P2P packets, which are, you know, happen relatively slowly at maybe a couple of hundreds or so a second. So um, what we really want is to have this capability of hardware timestamps with well-defined behavior, like where is this packet timestamped in the hardware um, at line rate. So if we have a 200 million packets per second NIC, we want to be able to see 200 million packets per second bidirectional timestamping. And, and the reason for this is that timestamping increasingly is used in, by advanced um, congestion control algorithms, uh, like BBR Swift uh, is one example of this, uh, which use these uh, hardware timestamp to more accurately uh, compute the um, network delay, the propagation time, and use that for TCP to um, to you know get a fair share of, of the of the bandwidth of the network. Um, one small point here is that where the timestamp is taken is very important. Um, we've seen at least one example where the transmit timestamp um, could be uh, taken um, when the completion is sent to the host. Um, but if there was PCI Express back pressure, this completion is actually delayed until well after the packet was sent on the wire. So it was a sort of a worst case estimate, but it was actually at the tail, it was not a good uh, representation of uh, transmission time. So there are a lot of details to get right there as well. Um, and then um, besides taking timestamps, once we have a, 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 a precise NIC clock, we really would like to also use this to uh, for the host to offload the host for sending packets. So um, uh, my teammate Eric Dumas gave a talk on um, earliest delivery time, earliest departure time. I'm sorry, uh, a while ago in NetApp, I won't fully re re repeat it here, um, but we really, um, without hardware offload, 
the way we use EDT is that the TCP stack computes a timestamp for every packet that it should be delivered. And instead of setting a timer to wake up the TCP stack to send it, it passes it to uh, traffic shaping, um, the FQ scheduler. Uh, and internally, FQ still sets uh, uh, timers for when it should be woken up to send out a packet. But now at least it's one timer across many different flows. Like we're talking hundreds of uh, tens of thousands, at least, of flows, um, active flows on these machines, and maybe millions of, of connections in some state. Um, so that's already better, but even, even preferable is to actually offload this to hardware um, so that um, the host passes a, 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 an SKB with the timestamp of some delivery time in the future to the network card, and the network card will send this out. And this is a, uh, um, well, it's kind of arguable, but let's say it's an, it's an O1 uh, data structure. Um, so it is uh, amenable to implementation in hardware. Um, and uh, software implementation of this uh, software NIC we presented at, uh, at SIGCOM. So these, this time part is definitely a little bit more, I think, on the edge. I don't think everyone uses this. Um, so whether or not that will make it into a spec is a uh, few one is, is, is uh, sort of debatable. Uh, that's the point of having the industry uh, conversation. Uh, so as I said, we've already upstreamed a bunch of our internal tasks because you know, this, these are these are standard Linux features. There's really no reason for Google to keep these proprietary. Certainly not if others are going to implement the same tests. Um, so I I guess and hope that others have implemented feature tests that that we don't have or or you know are are better and um, you know share those as well. Clearly, Option Linux is willing to take these. Um, as I said, there are a bunch missing. Uh, telemetry being a good example. Um, also important is performance aspect, characterizing performance, and not just you know the the big numbers on the box, the the GP uh, gigabits per second or, or packets per second. Also latency as well as latency when the network stack is not hot. Like a lot of micro benchmarks will test a system when it's hot, um, just maximizing transaction rate. But in practice, um, machines aren't necessarily running that hot. Um, and if they are, they might be running hot with other workloads and networking is just a small fraction. Um, so we really want to share um, the kind of work, the kind of trans transport layer tests that we use um, as a um, um, indication of how we expect our, our production workload to, to behave. Um, we used to run a lot of NetPerf tests, like I think many. At some point, we wrote uh, Nepper internally, and we've uh, open sourced that, which is like NetPerf, but it allows starting many streams um, across many CPUs, uh, more or less concurrently, more so than if you do it with NetPerf processes. Um, aggregate the results, use ePoll, um, and we basically run a matrix of Nepper tests. Um, as I show here, um, between multiple flows, multiple threads. And one thing we also care a lot about is that the performance numbers that we observe are relatively stable across these metrics, right? So if a, if a NIC um, advertises 200 million packets per second, it can only do it with eight queues. And if you uh, create 32 queues, performance craters, um, we don't want to see that because we actually have different platforms and we have different um, workloads and we might configure the system in different ways. Um, but at the very least, we want to know this. Um, so we want to have these regression tests at, uh, at the transport layer. Um, so where are we with this effort? Uh, we're basically developing two specs right now. The, the core features uh, that I gave the example and really, you know, segmentation offload, checksum offload, receive offload. Um, and potentially we will go into these things like um, using uh, hardware timestamping, um, that's kind of up for debate. And concurrently, there's this inline crypto offload uh, spec, which is definitely more advanced, uh, but very topical. And you know, some people really care about that and, and, and don't want to wait. So I think that's fine. The effort here is uh, we need basically an editor to, to champion an effort. Um, and uh, the idea is to take the Google PSP protocol spec and convert that into a device spec. Like what does a device need to do to support PSP as well as ESP and, and, and probably quick um, because a lot of the hardware features are actually the same uh, for all of them. Um, then um, I wanna you know, invite everyone uh, to, to contribute if you're, whether you represent an organization that has a large deployment of, of cards or um, our vendor. Um, the OCP model is that everyone who contributes who actually to the writing uh, signs a contributor license agreement um, when 
and the spec is essentially shared only between the organizations and the people writing for a while. Um, so that's one option. Then, uh, at least for the initial spec, our goal is really to share it with the community in like three to six months, get community feedback, even if you, you know, don't uh, sign the CLA to get your feedback involved. Um, and then um, uh, with that feedback, basically publish it via V1. Um, you can also um, champion other efforts, uh, particularly, and I want to point this out, these don't have to be specs um, written as a, from a clean slate. If there's something like the Google PSP spec, if you have an internal spec that you've shared um, under NDA, but maybe, or one-on-one -on -one at least, that um, is a good starting point for standardizing. Um, these have to be fairly non-controversial um, su suggestions that the whole industry you know, sees the value of. Um, then o the OCP is a, is a potential good a venue for doing this, um, and we can shepherd it through the uh, the NIC software effort within OCP networking. So there's a, a monthly call, there's a mailing list, um, and if you know, if um, so that is it in a uh, in a nutshell. Um, our effort to 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 come to a standard degree standard understanding of uh, or a shared understanding of, of what uh, we want from network cards at these speeds for these kind of deployments um, and to uh, to standardize that through OCP. Are there any questions? Any questions here online? I myself have many questions, but I know I'm going to be talking to you in the near future, so I'm going to hold off for now. Okay. Um, I think that's it. We can wrap up here. So thanks everybody for joining. And uh, see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. I, I think it's at four. Yeah. Oh, 345. Yeah. 15. Yeah. Again, later discussions being really later.